thank you very much for that warm welcome and thank you for the rain because we haven't seen that in <laughs> years, I think. Um, so I am going to talk about what's the evidence about what's in our prevention toolbox. And I'm hoping that this will be an audience participation um, engagement because I hope to learn as much from you uh, as you will learn from these slides. And I guess I'm just going to just start with a couple of uh, questions. This is about the national epidemic, and then I'm hoping I can hear more about your local epidemic. But um, you probably are all aware of this, but um, when I ask this in audiences, uh, people often are not clear about which US subpopulation are new infections increasing. And you can answer this in your own uh, mind, uh, people who inject drugs, African-American women, men who have sex with men, or non-infections are stable or decline in all, in all groups. And um, I think you probably know that about 80% of the new infections um, in the United States, about 38,000 per year, are in men. 20% are in women. Uh, and I did start out in the, the early stages of the epidemic when there was very little in women. So this is a, a huge increase in women. Um, and if you look at w the number of new infections in 2010, um, the first three categories are all men who have sex with men, uh, white, black, and Latino. Uh, and then black heterosexual women come shortly after that group. Uh, that's misleading, though, because that's the absolute number. And this is um, per 100,000 individuals. And of course, uh, we have these huge disparities that need to be addressed, that uh, we see much higher rates in black and Hispanic men and black and Hispanic women compared with white uh, men and women. But you can also see that the rates are quite high in men compared with women in each of these uh, racial categories. So good news and bad news. I like to start with the good news. The good news is that we're down 21% in new infections in um, black women in the United States, which is fantastic. Uh, and we need, we, it's still 61,000, uh, 6,100, uh, sorry, 6,100 new infections in 2010, so we still have room to move. Um, but the bad news is that particularly young men who have sex with men, the new infection rates are increasing. So we're, um, we're making headway in some places, but not in others. This is my last question, and um, then we'll move on. Uh, so the US national HIV AIDS strategy calls for 90% of positives to know their infection status by 2015. So which group has met its goals? People who inject drugs, heterosexual men and women, men who have sex with men, or none has met the 90% target? And the answer is, uh, actually, if you look at the 90% target, all three injection drug using groups have met their target. We're seeing increases in knowledge of HIV status in heterosexual men and women, and the only group where we're not making any headway is men who have sex with men which may have something to do with that increased rate of new infections. And if you look at the 13 to 24 year olds, I mean, we're talking about we want 90%. This is 40%. Mm -hmm. um, it's really abysmal. So I'm going to start with what's in our prevention toolbox. You can't start with prevention unless you know your zero status. Um, and so testing is really important. And you probably are aware of Project AWARE, um, which was a study of rapid testing with or without counseling, pre and post test counseling, in over 5,000 STD clinic patients in nine US cities. And what they found is overall there was actually no difference um, in the rate of recurrent sexually transmitted infections at six months in those who were versus were not counseled. And in men, actually, there was a higher rate of new infections in the counseled group. Not quite clear why that happened. Um, but uh, I think we're at a new stage in the epidemic. And clearly, early in the epidemic, people really needed the counseling to know more about HIV and what their risk was. And now, what we really need to do is get these tests out. So um, we, we, 
I really urge uh, clinicians to test all of their, offer a test to all of their patients at least once, and generally I just say, we like to get an HIV test on every, on everyone at least once. Would you, um, would you be willing to be tested? And I have one patient in all of this time who has refused to be tested, who unfortunately was a, an older man who had sex with men who just refused to be tested, was uh, just said, don't want to know, don't care. Um, he wasn't my patient, but I tried, but I didn't get very far. But most people are really pleased to be asked. Um, I think that rapid testing has really revolutionized uh, the situation of knowing serostatus. The estimate of unknown infections has dropped from 25% of the HIV-infected population in the U.S. not knowing to 16%. So we are making headway. Um, <coughs> just to pay attention to their new algorithms and new generations of tests, and that's really important for determining who's acutely infected, and we're getting better at doing that. And then there's the home HIV test that was licensed in July of 2012. So I'm going to turn now to potential tools for uh, HIV negative at risk, and start by saying that all of these are behavioral, but some also have a biomedical component, and some are more exclusively behavioral or support mechanisms. And I'm going to, this is my top 10 list. There obviously are more uh, things to talk about, but we have condoms, PrEP, male circumcision, treatment of substance use, mental health treatment, um, sexually transmitted infections, screening and treatment, and then behavioral interventions, adherence interventions, case management, and technology-based interventions. And uh, spoiler alert, I thought I would give you um, what my interpretation of this is so that you have this framework as you move forward. So um, I believe that there's really compelling evidence for condoms, pre-exposure prophylaxis, adherence interventions, case management, and technology-based interventions. I think um, there's less, that there's a lot of work being done. There's less definitive data on substance use, mental health, STI screening and treatment, behavioral interventions, I think we, ha we do have some tools. It's not that there's nothing there, um, but it's, um, it's not enough yet. And uh, male circumcision, uh, I'm going to show you, I think is, doesn't have a huge public health role in the United States. I'm, I'm really talking about our domestic epidemics. So start with condoms. Um, you know, people really push condoms, and they should. And it's also true that um, the estimate is only about 85% efficacy uh, or eff effectiveness. And in, well, it's probably efficacy because it's probably even lower when you get to effectiveness. And in men who have sex with men, it's actually lower than that. And the, the reason for that is probably, uh, and that's in the per contact risk, um, kind of slip and break, they're not infallible, and they probably slip and break more for anal sex than they do for vaginal sex. So even in studies that have been done with stable heterosexual couples having vaginal sex, um, there was a breakage rate of about 1% to 2%. And in many studies, 15 to 20% of men who have sex with men report breakage or slippage in the last six months. Um, and uh, the, the bottom line here is um, practice makes perfect. The uh, breakage is associated with infrequent use, not using lube or inappropriate lube or substance use. Um, there are some problems with some of the, the lubes, and so we really have to pay attention to that. And we're actually doing a study that Alex is part of. Um, he's leading the uh, adherence component of this, uh, looking at um, uh, rectally for, uh, uh, a microbicide that's formulated for rectal use because if it's hyperosmolar, it can cause rectal damage. Um, and N9, we all know, has caused, um, does cause rectal damage. Um, but the biggest problem with condoms are desirability, interference with sex and sexual performance. Many people can't use condoms. It, they are not able to maintain erections if they use them. Um, and also just consistent use. And um, as one of my favorite quote was uh, an NIH colleague came to San Francisco to give a talk on HIV vaccines many years ago. And somebody in the audience raised their hand and said, why do we need a vaccine? We know how to prevent HIV. And she said, if behavior change were easy, I'd be thin. 
Um, so I think we need to uh, recognize that uh, sex is complex, people are complex, and that condoms don't work for everyone. Um, and that even when they do work, they don't work all of the time. Susan, can you say a little bit more about what that 85% and the 78% actually means? Because it doesn't mean that no. in 50% of the cases you get infected. Right. No, it doesn't. Um, so I think that the issue is we get lots of different estimates about what efficacy and effectiveness there is. The idea is that presumably if you use condoms properly every time, you should get closer to 100% um, efficacy. But in fact, even when people say they're using them 100% of the time, um, and this is the reduction in per contact risk, this is just an estimate based on um, studies, is that it doesn't work all the time because they slip or break off or because people don't use them the entire time during sex. So we were just getting ready to enroll a participant two weeks ago into one of our vaccine trials. And um, we did a pregnancy test on her. And she was pregnant, and she was very unhappy. She had a 10-month-old at home. And she said, this isn't possible. We repeated the test, and she was pregnant. Um, and it turns out they do use condoms all of the time, but just not for throughout all of the sex. So um, they put the condoms on right before ejaculation, but there can be semen in the pre-ejaculate, particularly if you're having sex multiple times in a day. Um, so she wasn't enrolled in the, um, in the study, but, and she was, uh, so, I mean, they're not perfect for um, birth control either. So PrEP, um, I don't know if it's on the wires yet, but um, there was, uh, there's data, there was a press release just this morning that a randomized control trial of PrEP in men who have sex with men um, in England was stopped early because of high levels of efficacy. And we'll see the data uh, hopefully in the next few months. But um, these are data from the first um, PrEP study in men who have sex with men and trans women on four continents, so North and South America, Africa, and Asia. And the goal is, this is the probability of infection, so we'd love for it to just stay down at zero. It does go up. This is the placebo rate. And this was the uh, rate of people taking uh, emtricitabine tenofovir, otherwise known as Travada, a single pill a day. Um, and you can see that there was uh, a 42% reduction um, uh, overall. It's, uh, and that was very highly statistically significant. And this is actually from a meta-analysis that just combines data from all of the, the efficacy studies of both topical and oral PrEP. Um, so uh, this one is the, the vaginal preparation, and the others are all oral. And the studies have been done in men with sex with men, a small number of trans women. So there's actually quite a bit of work that needs to be done on looking at uh, PrEP for trans women, serodiscordant heterosexual couples, people who are heterosexual men and women who aren't in couples, people who inject drugs. And this side is good, and this side is bad. And you can see that almost all the trials at least tend towards this side. And the, the trials that don't do so well are those where um, the uh, adherence to PrEP was not great. So uh, hopefully we'll have some time to talk about uh, PrEP in various populations. And, and really, one of the key issues is PrEP won't work if you don't take it, obviously. And these are data showing the, the levels of drug in the blood in people who became infected, who get, were, received Travada, who became infected, and those who didn't. And you can see that the levels vary. And only 52% of the men in the IPREX trial um, had detectable levels, and those that did had varying levels, indicating that probably they were taking the drug um, more or less faithfully. But only 9% of those who became infected actually had any detectable drug, and all of those had very low levels. So from these data, the suggestion is that there could be over 90% reduction in new infections. Um, in people who take PrEP, which is, you know, we're talking about the same order of magnitude as condoms um, among those who take it daily. And what you should know is people say, but nobody takes it. 
But in this study, 97% of the US participants took it. And I think that the reasons that uh, people were not taking the drug in other countries are complex, and I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. Okay. Could you just go back for a second? Absolutely. Is there, is there a sense of, of how those drug levels correlate with adherence? Like yes. The ones yes. Are yes. Or yes. Like so what I didn't show is that there are data. Um, so these are all a little bit flawed because um, when you do a randomized trial, you're saying we're taking everybody here gets a random number and half get the drug and half get placebo. But when we say um, uh, when we only look at among the people who got the drug who took it and who didn't, that could be like this side took it and this side um, did not take it, but this side got here early, right? We're different, and so we're not randomly assigned. And so in the same way, people who take their drug regularly are probably different in all kinds of ways in terms of their health. That said, the idea is that if you take four or more pills a week, the levels that, are, that correlate with that, that the level of efficacy is very high, sort of on the order of 98%. Um, that when you get down to two a week, that your, your, your level of efficacy drops somewhat. Um, the issue is that those are the levels that correspond. And so some people say, oh, well, you only need to take it four times a week. But if you're trying to take it four times a week, then how many times do you actually take it? So um, what we say, what the great thing about PrEP is, that there's this forgiveness in the drug, which means that you can miss a pill here and there, and you're still covered because the reason that Travada was chosen in the first place is it has this really long intracellular half-life. But um, it doesn't mean that you can just pop a pill here and there, and, it's, right. and you're good to go. No, I was just wondering if, if what, oh, what higher this, levels, did, did, yes. if, if there was a sense of how inherent those people were. But yes, this might be daily. Technical Daily, yeah, Daily. and so yeah, and so the actually in the IPREX OLE study, OLE stood for open label extension. Um, nobody who was taking four or more doses a week has become infected. So, so this is about the number needed to treat, and I I think uh, Dave Glidden presented this at Croy, and I think this is really interesting. That obviously what we'd like is to have the lowest number needed to treat in order to prevent infections. And this is what the infection rate would be like in the untreated group. So what you can see is that, and then the, this curve is for 30% efficacy, 50% efficacy, 70% efficacy. So you can see that once you get to a very high rate of new infections, 9% per year, you don't need really high efficacy to have a fairly small number needed to treat to prevent infections because you've got so many that you're, you're um, doing very well. Alternatively, in the Bangkok study where the infection rate in uh, people who inject drugs was relatively low, um, the number needed to treat was fairly high. And so really, for injection drug users, the first and foremost thing we should be doing is giving people clean injection equipment. Um, but they may also warrant uh, PrEP. And what you can see is that um, the what we're talking about here is on the order of you know 50 to 100, generally around the 50 to 70 people needed to treat to prevent um, infection in a year across all of these studies. And I just to put it in context because people say, oh, but if we give people prep, then they're going to have more sex, like that's a bad thing, or um, you know they're going to have more sex without condoms. But I guess I just want to show you that this is the number needed to treat for statins um, for uh, anti-cholesterol meds, um, where the efficacy is also, the effectiveness is not completely high, both because people have underlying disease and also people don't always take their statins. But we don't, as providers say, we're not going to give you a statin because we're afraid you're going to have more ice cream. <laughs> we just give you the statin, right? So I think, and statins can be quite expensive. So I think that... That is helpful, I think, to put things in context. And then if you look at, well, who should we treat? So this is now the number needed to treat 
And this is the population attributable fraction. So the population attributable fraction is taking into account not only how risky is something, but how much is it driving the epidemic. So something that's really risky, but almost nobody does, like let's say getting infected from a blood transfusion, um, that's not what's driving the epidemic because it doesn't happen very often. Whereas other kinds of things that um, happen more frequently that are also risky will drive the infection. So ideally, you'd like to be treating people who are in this quadrant. Um, lowest number needed to treat, highest population attributable fraction. And what you can see is that being a bottom without a condom, this is for everyone, and this is with a partner of unknown serostatus. Um, the number needed to treat is less than 50, and uh, the population attributable, attributable fraction is high. So we could have a pretty substantial impact on the epidemic, we believe, if people who are unprotected bottoms were got PrEP. And this is based on the IPREX study, which was not completely effective, um, or the, the efficacy was in the uh, low 40s percent because a lot of people weren't taking it. And what you can see is that, um, in fact, uh, being, having a, being an unprotected, bo being a, a bottom without a condom with a negative partner, uh, although it doesn't contribute to a huge number of infections, is also pretty low number needed to treat. Um, and that's one thing that we've got to remember is that, uh, whereas having a single partner, which is what a lot of people um, say, oh, what we've heard from patients is that they go to their provider and the provider says, I'm not going to give you PrEP. I only give it to people who are in stable relationships with a positive. Um, people who are in a stable relationship with a positive have often figured out how to keep themselves negative. Um, and actually, it's people who have multiple partners who may be at higher risk. Um, and having just one partner uh, actually has a much higher number needed to treat. So. Um, this has got to be a conversation between people who might, potential PrEP users and their providers. And I'm just going to uh, introduce, in case you haven't seen it, I love reading anything by Atul Gawande. And this is an article he wrote in The New Yorker about um, fast versus slow ideas. And uh, he, he compares anesthesia and antisepsis, both of which um, interventions were developed around the same time but um, one of which took off very fast and one of which took off slowly. So, oops. So anesthesia, um, the very first demonstration uh, was in October of 1946. The, uh, 1846, sorry. That would really be a bummer. Um, <laughs> the first publication was a month later. So how's that for speedy uh, publications? Um, by mid-December, it was already being used in Paris and London. By um, February of the next year, so that's like five months later, almost all of Europe had anesthesia. Um, by June, most regions of the world had it. And uh, within seven years, nearly every hospital um, had anesthesia. And you can imagine that both the patients and the providers really wanted anesthesia. Before that, it was just horrific, right? Um, now liken that to antisepsis. So, uh, in the mid-1980s, about half of people who underwent surgery for any reason died because of infection. And in fact, the thought was, oh, well, you need to have pus. That's just part of the healing process. Um, so the first publication that if you used an antiseptic that you could prevent infections came in 1867, right? So same sort of er era. 20 years later, yeah, they were sometimes start, you know, using clean equipment, but they were also just staying in their gowns that were soaked in blood and had you know, caked on pieces of you know, uh, tissue. And they reused gauze and sponges without sterilizing them. Um, and it was a generation before Lister's recommendations became routine. And there are probably a, a number of reasons for this. Um, some of it is that you know germs are invisible, but somebody writhing on an operating table is not invisible. Um, this both helped patients. This is what really helped um, providers. This was hard to implement. I mean, it was just unpleasant to begin with and required a lot of additional steps. But obviously, this was critical to driving down mortality after surgery. So there's a great. Um, 
uh, piece in the Huffington Post um, in October written by <coughs> David Evans and Dana Van Gorder, um, two activists, that PrEP should be a fast idea, not a slow one. And a really nice, if you haven't gone to My Prep Experience, um, it's, a, it's a lovely blog that has um, pieces written by people who are taking PrEP and their experiences. And you know, I think people say, well, why would you go on an antiretroviral for life it, you know, to prevent infection? It's not for life. It's during what we call seasons of risk. And people are not necessarily at risk throughout their lives. So I'll speed up here. Circumcision. Bottom line is, it's not likely to have a big public health impact in the United States. These are some, um, some uh, estimates about the number of infections uh, that could be averted, the, the incidence. Um, if you circumcise just 50%, and even if you circumcise 100%, and even over 20 years, you're, you're not going to be driving down the new infections by very much. So. Um, this could be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis, but for most uh, men in the United States, male circumcision isn't the answer to this. Substance use treatment. Um, there's a lot of really exciting work being done in substance use treatment, and we may have some experts here in the audience. What I would say is that we know that substance use is associated with um, HIV infection, um, alcohol, meth use, and men who have sex with men. Poppers um, and erectile dysfunction drugs have been associated with HIV infection, but it's hard to know whether, you know, which comes first um, because uh, poppers and erectile dysfunction drugs are often used to have sex, right? So it's, it's not clear that the drugs are causing the, uh, the risky practices. Um, there are a number of pharmacologic interventions under development, and there are lots of behavioral interventions that have been tried. I, my reading of the literature is that the results are mixed, and that the best data we have so far is potentially with contingency management, paying people to keep their <coughs> urines clean. Um, but I think we, again, have more work to do in that area. Mental health treatment, this is a little bit like, I don't know, um, bringing Coles to Newcastle or something for me to be talking to all of you about mental health treatment. Um, in HIV positives, I think there's a high prevalence of depression, and there's no question that depression treatment, meds, and or psychotherapy are associated with improved adherence. No question. And there's no question that people with depression or mental health issues need to be treated for their overall health. I would say that the data are less clear for HIV negatives. Um, many studies find that risk practices are more common in people who are depressed or have other mental health issues. There's not a lot of data and not great data that treating those reduces HIV infection rates. It, um, part of the challenge is that it may, re it may lead to reductions in self-reported risk. The question is, is it just the self-report or is it the actual risk? So I would say that absolutely we need to scale up uh, mental health treatment. But whether or not that in and of itself is going to drive down infection rates to me isn't clear. Sexually transmitted infection screening and treatment. Can I make uh, a little comment about? Please do. I, I think I'm, I'm so happy that you put mental health there. And yes. Even though it's his audience. I wish I could come to your grand rounds. I would. Love <laughs> it. A, a, the reality is that a lot of the incident studies, the prevalence studies, we don't do any measure. You know, we don't do any incident studies, any measurements that can lead us to think of mental health. So. To do an intervention on an HIV negative when the rate of transmission is so slow, you would need you know, these dramatic numbers of people in a sample to show a decrease in infection, whereas epi studies very seldom, because the burden of disease of mental health and we don't think of mental health in general, has not, you know, is not part of the study. So that's why it's so hard. I could not agree with you more. Um, I think that there's no question that mental health treatment is critical and that it may very well play an important role here. It clearly plays a role for positives. It's likely to play a role for negatives as well, particularly if you're, trying, if you're talking about adherence to other interventions as well. And clearly, I mean, you know, I remember a participant came in and was talking about when he gets stressed, 
he goes out and has condomless sex. And one of my counselors said, so you expose yourself to a life-threatening illness when you're feeling bad? You know, that's how you deal with your feeling bad? And he said, yeah, that is why. You know, and we all do things that are unhealthy when we're feeling bad. So if you could feel better, um, I think it, there's no question that it's plausible. I just think that we don't have the data yet. So the cause that I think the two of us are doing is that any episode of the large studies should include measures. Absolutely. Measures Absolutely. So no question. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I recommend that everybody go to that Grand Rounds. <laughs> um, so here's STI screening and treatment. And herpes has the greatest attributable fraction to new infections. Unfortunately, uh, several trials didn't show that treating herpes reduced new HIV infections. We think that it may be because, uh, for a number of reasons, the dosing of the anti-herpes meds may have been too low. Um, herpes also sets up some chronic inflammatory responses, even if you're reducing outbreaks, it, they're still uh, susceptible target cells. So unfortunately, those studies have not been effective. We think that um, gonorrhea and chlamydia contribute uh, to 10 to 15 percent of new infections, and I would say that's in men who have sex with men, and it could be even higher in women. Um, and we're seeing this huge surge in new uh, sexually transmitted infections in HIV negatives and positives in men who have sex with men. Um, and that's probably true as people are doing more seroadaptive practices, having sex only with people they believe to be negative if you're negative and only positive if you're positive, that uh, that doesn't prevent the, dis the spread of other sexually transmitted infections. Um, and a lot of, and rectal infections are generally asymptomatic. So it's really, really, really important to screen for this. But it's not yet clear if aggressive screening and treatment will drive down infection rates. It's still the right thing to do, um, and it may have an effect in the same way that um, mental health is, is absolutely the right thing to do and may have an, a, an impact. We just don't have the data to show it. So now I'm going to venture into more controversial territory with risk reduction interventions and just say that I think that this is a huge and complex literature and we have to take into account that there are both diverse and changing community needs that challenges, that there are challenges in um, using self-report as an outcome because if you tell people we really, really, really want you to reduce your risk, um, you should expect that they're going to say, I really, really, really reduced my risk. Um, and uh, we, it's, it's also really costly to do big studies with an HIV infection outcome. Um, and even uh, some of the most um, intensive interventions have had a modest impact on condomless sex, but they're often statistically significant. But generally, we're talking in the order of 20 to 30 percent reduction, and often it's usually um, time limited. But I'll also say that the control conditions are usually not real controls. I mean, they're, they're, you get much better standard in the controls. So if you're driving down everybody's infection rates, and then you get a little bit of additional benefit, you, it may be harder to see it. Um, but there are also issues about the desirability of interventions, and I'll, I'm going to show you one of those, and generalizability, and then also, can we develop interventions that can be scaled? So these are data from Explore, which was a very intensive one-on-one -on -one behavioral intervention. We were one of the sites, um, and uh, there was also a New York site, and this was a 10-session intervention, individual one-on-one -on -one counseling with booster doses every three months, and the standard um, intervention is in the blue and the um, uh, the standard the control and the the intervention group is in the lighter blue the turquoise and you can see that there's a there is a significant reduction particularly at the six month time point and then they sort of drift together um, I will tell you that the dropout rate in the people who got the intervention was substantially higher than in the group that didn't so it wasn't a very desirable intervention for our participants, and that was particularly true for people of color. And I will say that, um, you know, we, part of the issue was it, was it was also, it was very intense, and people said, well, we have to do this because we need the Cadillac version of 
uh, interventions. And my staff said, do you have any idea how hard it is to park a Cadillac in San Francisco? Um, so, and it was really true. In San Francisco, the guys were not into this, whereas in Boston, they were much, they stayed in the study. So there were, you know, regional differences. There were differences in terms of um, either in different, different subpopulations. But we didn't see much there. And I'm going to contrast that with the Many Men, Many Voices um, study uh, that enrolled black men who have sex with men, over 300, and there was a weekend group intervention. This is the men, Many Men, Many Voices um, group, and this is the mean number of condomless anal sex um, episodes with a casual partner. And you can see that, that there was a really substantial decline um, in the intervention group. It's only six months. But we think that there is a role, no question, for um, behavioral interventions and that particularly tailored interventions that are going to be desirable um, and culturally responsive to groups that are at risk is, is quite important. Adherence interventions are also a, um, a mixed bag. And there's a really nice uh, review by Julia Marcus um, looking at, well, what have what prevention isn't unique to you to HIV? What do we what have we learned from other prevention literature um, for hypertension, for um, latent uh, TB infection, for uh, cholesterol, for oral contraceptives, for osteoporosis, for malaria, post exposure prophylaxis? All things that don't cause symptoms that you need to take some prevention on a regular basis in order for it to work. She reviewed 585 studies, 64 met the eligibility criteria. The 10 with the strongest evidence were for high blood pressure and um, cholesterol. And it looked like using multimodal intensive or low cost, low intensity, both were effective. Most showed a benefit, though, that was somewhat modest, only four to six months of follow up. So here's some examples like three phone calls over four months to discuss adherence, reminders of visits and 20% achieved control of their lipids. Here's one where just asking people to record their blood pressure on a card. 17% um, showed at least a 10% reduction in their blood pressure at 12 months. Um, and a systematic review for chronic diseases, another really nice um, review, showed that a lot of the issues are uh, systemic and um, uh, more about delivery of health care, so reducing co-pays, increasing coverage, case management, and participant uh, patient level education with behavioral support were the things that worked best. Um, so I'm going to talk about case management and just say that um, there's a lot of variability in the programs, and it's a controver controversial lesson, but literature, but what I've learned from it is that it's helpful for depressed patients in particular. Um, that for HIV positives, it has definitely been associated with increased adherence to antiretrovirals. And this talk, I'm really focusing on the negatives, but there's no question that the way we will drive down infections globally as well as domestically is by getting more people tested and getting positives onto treatment for their own health as well as for um, transmission. For substance users, there's um, a moderate effect on linkage to other services. Um, modest or small effect on drug use. Um, contingency management comes up again um, as potentially being helpful. And, and case management can be a, helpful for adherence in some other studies. So I'm going to just um, end with technology-based interventions, um, the bright new shiny object, um, <laughs> and say that uh, across multiple populations in this um, meta-analysis, uh, they, these um, computer technology interventions were used to uh, were shown to increase con increase condom use, decrease the frequency of, and number of partners, decrease the sexually transmitted infections. But they're mostly modest effects. The advantages to it, though, is that they're scalable, they're deliverable, that they may be better at reaching youth, and that they have the potential to impact underserved populations. Um, so texting, does that work to improve antiretroviral adherence? Yes, yes, it does. Um, but these are the things that helped. Less than daily contact, so sometimes less is more. 
bi-directional communication, so just sort of checking in and saying, Any, how are you doing, getting feedback so that it, you can triage people who need some additional help, letting people personalize the messages for themselves, and timing it to their dosing seem to be most effective. And I'm going to show you my favorite um, texting intervention, which was about sunscreen. And what I really love about this is this is the equivalent of a MEMS cap for sunscreen. Every time you remove the cap for the sunscreen, it registers on this computer. Um, and what they would text is something that was helpful, like, Tuesday, sunny, high 73, low 61, slap on some sunscreen today, right? So that would actually be useful. Um, and here's what they saw was that um, this is relatively short, short period. This is the um, reminder group. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the control group. And you can see that the proportion who are adhering to sunscreen, 50% to begin with, and it got down to about 20% or less um, at six weeks. But they were able to maintain that relatively high level in the group that got the texting. And they even did it. They, did, they got this improvement in rainy weather, in cloudy weather, and in sunny weather. And you can see that in rainy weather, um, it was even better. So um, give people something that they can work with and that's useful for them, and they may pay attention to your text. So this is my final slide, just to go back to I think the evidence is strongest for condoms prep, adherence intervention, case management, technology-based interventions. I think, it's, I think we're still in the discovery phase for treatment of substance use, mental health treatment, STI screening and treatment, and behavioral interventions. There clearly is benefit, but trying to figure out the best interventions and how to scale them is not clear. And I don't think male circumcision is going to have much of a public health impact. So that's what I had to say, and then I'm happy to have a discussion about it.